Our story begins in 2014, after the largest financial crisis the world had ever experienced since the crash of 1929. Since then, we've made it our mission to democratize the very best financial intelligence. We broke the story of Bitcoin in 2014 before the general public even knew what it was. We've made award-winning documentaries and series about some of the most important economic and geopolitical events of our time that have amassed millions of views across platforms. And we've spoken with investing legends about trends years before they played out. Here at Real Vision, we don't follow the news, we make the news. This week on social media, we'll be showcasing some of the most important pieces in our history, unlocking some of them for you to watch for free and sharing important takeaways from them that will be useful for you in today's markets. So be sure to tune in. We also have a very special offer just for you guys. To learn more, simply click on the link in the description or scan the QR code. What does rate volatility mean for you? Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. With me today is Tony Greer, founder of TG Macro and editor of the Morning Navigator newsletter. Hey, Tony. How are you today, Maggie? I'm doing all right. A lot going on today. We had Moody's downgrade some re U.S. regional banks, kind of reminding us that's still a problem. Uh, export data from China was the weakest since the COVID lockdowns began, so that caught a lot of people uh, a little off guard maybe, and certainly raised some eyebrows. So, uh, and we have a lot of movement in the market. What, as you look across, what was top of mind for you? Yeah, you know, you nailed it on right on the head, Maggie. Those two uh, simultaneous headlines had the S&P, you know, on its back early at 9, 30, 10 o'clock this morning. It traded to a new low for the move of 44.82. We saw, you know, a classic, you know, pre-waterfall type sell-off. We saw the VIX spike to 18. Um, with the morning selling, we saw a tick index low near minus 1500, which is an extreme selling level. Uh, we had oil under $80. We had LME copper breaking down under the 200 day moving average. I mean, at 930 this morning, the whole thing looked like it wanted to keel over and die. Right. And then what happened was, quite honestly, in my eyes, the energy spread started by holding in on the dip, and I'm talking about September, October calendar spreads in crude oil, gasoline, diesel fuel. They held in on their deep, extreme dip levels. Next thing you know, spot prices recovered in energy. You had a full reversal of the commodity complex um, with a $3 rally in a straight line in oil. And it turned into much less of a de-risking day. I think the S&P still ended the day down a little bit. Um, but we had a lot of sectors recover. There were two Sigma type sell offs this morning in everything banking, right? KRE, KBE, XLF, Bank America, Goldman Sachs, JP Diamond, all of it was two Sigmas, two Sigma move in the hole. Um, that's, that's selling wore itself out. What happened was today, in my eyes, there was no materialization of that just agnostic get me out of the SP. It's been a nice run type of selling. So when that didn't materialize and energy stabilized, $3 rally in oil, you know, that's risk on for all the oil stock traders, at least. We saw all the energy sectors plus airlines, oil services, and utilities settle in positive territory today. The biggest losers of the day was everything technology, semiconductors, software, cybersecurity, internet stocks. So that's, you know, more signs that we're seeing the commodity-based stocks hold in with higher interest rates and tech stocks not really able to do the same with higher interest rates. So that's kind of the broad vibe that I'm getting from the market right now. Yeah, and you're right, because while I was watching the action early in the morning, I thought, oh gosh, here we go. Because it did look like it was getting that feeling like everybody just wanted to bust lower and you're gonna get one of those momentum days that just fed on itself and then it didn't. Some people talking about the fact, they think there was a treasury auction that went okay too. Um, maybe that helped on the outside. But, you know, speaking of treasuries, it's really interesting because um, Jim Bianco tweeted out a chart earlier today that caught our attention. Um, and it's been coming up a lot on, on the programs we've been doing, the volatility in bonds. I mean, you know, for, for folks who aren't, I think Jim said this, who aren't used to watching it, these are big moves in bonds we're seeing. And it's all over the place. It's been ricocheting back and forth. 
um, there's a chart, I believe, of the tenure. And uh, a lot of it seems to be based off this re recession, no landing, inflation. We've got inflation data coming out uh, later this week and a lot of division. I know that you talked to Kevin Muir on the platform today and you guys spoke about that for, for quite a bit and we're kind of tackling the whole bond issue, weren't you? Yeah, well, Kevin was tackling it and I was listening. Let me tell you, Maggie, he's forgotten more about the bond market than I'll ever know. So I'm all ears when I talk to Kevin Muir and uh, filled with questions and I get a lot of answers from him. And the conversation today kind of gave me a little bit of confidence that broadly speaking, the way I want to approach this market is that rates are going higher and we are going to be um, fighting in fits and starts, but we are going to be fighting inflationary battles that are going to cause these dislocations in the bond market. So that's what I came away with from it today. And he, he dropped a lot of eureka moments on us, man. Kevin knows how to unpack certain markets better than anybody I've ever heard. So there was some really valuable stuff going back and forth today. Yeah, absolutely. And it couldn't have been more timely given the backdrop of volatility and that big debate, which is, you know, that's what's pulling it back and forth because one day there'll be stuff coming through that seems to confirm, you know, one camp and then the, on the other side. And and Tony's right. So it, for those of you who who don't see these and who aren't members, um, we do these peer-to-peer -peer interviews where we get frequent guests and people that we respect and admire, like Tony, to kind of flip roles and be the host and talk to people that they and traders, analysts, strategists, thought leaders that they follow and respect to kind of dive into a subject matter. And we actually have a clip from the conversation that Tony and Kevin have. Let's play it for you and then we'll talk on the other side. What's happening, I think, is that we're having the Fed raising rates. It's not really affecting the economy this, the way they think because private sector is locked in a lot of it. Consumer isn't moving, they're, they're not sensitive to it. And not only that, the higher rates are sticking more money in actually the private sector's genes. So it, it's ironically, what really needs to be done if you want it to slow down the economy is fiscal stimulus needs to be withdrawn, right? Like if we think it through, we in 20 kind of, let's say 2009 to 2020, the problem was there wasn't enough fiscal stimulus. And that's why the economy was so, you know, lethargic. Yeah, you know, lethargic. And yet now we have a situation where the economy is flying. And so, so, by the way, from 2008 to 2020, they kept trying to lower interest rates and, and, and push money through that way. It didn't work. Right. It was actually one of the, the, the crappiest you know, recoveries we've ever had. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we do all this fiscal. And yet instead of all saying, OK, we, now we should be pulling back on the fiscal because the economy is flying, they're doing the opposite. They're once again trying to fix it with interest rates. And monetary policy doesn't work the way we think, especially in a situation where everyone's already locked it in. And there's kind of uh, the Fed is in a really tough spot because the Fed's tools are not appropriate for the job. I mean, that was as good a, an explanation. I loved his analogy of sticking money in the pocket of the profits and the genes of the private <laughs> sector. That was, that was fantastic. That full conversation, by the way, with Tony hosting Kevin a must watch. You can find it on our website. And again, if you're not a member, check out the anniversary special that we are running. It's nuts. Um, so Tony, you know, how, how were you thinking about this when you walked away? I know that you had said you had some Eureka moments. Yeah. You know, one of the things I appreciate most about Kevin is um, he's not just an intellectual. He makes you think about your portfolio. Right. Yeah. And, and when we're talking about the risk to the world famous 60 40 portfolio, you know, that he kind of pointed out some of the pitfalls in. And, you know, all of us have some kind of a portfolio model in our head that we try to stick to. But what was so great about that conversation with Kevin is that he makes you think about the 40 part, right? He makes yeah. you think, am I safe, you know, within these bond ETFs that are just, you know, they're just a percentage of my portfolio because I've constructed a portfolio. But in reality terms, Am I facing what's really going on in the markets and making an adjustment to my portfolio so that it doesn't kill me? Right. Yeah. Like that's that's the important thing to take away from what Kevin is telling you, because in this spot conversation in the moment right now, oh, yeah, maybe yields go higher. Maybe inflation is a little bit more persistent than we think. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, six months down the road, your you know, your bond portfolio is off eight to 15 percent, which is like 
<laughs> why? You know, and that's the kind of stuff that I appreciate in talking about Kevin with. And and I have kicked the tires and already made some adjustments to yeah. my portfolio since that conversation today. Yeah, so you got in really there. You got in there and asked some great follow-ups too. And I, I I agree with you. I really like that. And the thing I liked about it, again, the whole thing was super accessible. And I think all of us just based on the fact that we all have to go through and sort of, you know, um, click those wheels, right? It's all through like in the PowerPoints, whether you're talking to your financial advisor or doing it yourself in your 401, it's like, what percentage do you want? And you sort of just get used to doing it by the names, but the conversation you both had really challenged you to say, what are they in there for? Like, what are they supposed to be doing? And based on what you believe, are they going to still provide you with that, right? Whether it's a head, that part was the part that you go, oh, okay. And now, different people have different thoughts about that and that's why i loved your follow-ups but it was it was super helpful because that's something we all need to think about right we've all got these percentages of assets in our what regardless of whether you're a professional or retail and you and we really sort of need to think carefully about that in this environment because you know it's a tough one so we're getting questions about um and of course you guys touched on commodities too so i just want to dive in with a question before we talk a little bit more um, and Trillian X asking, Tony, with this rebound in co the commodity related sector, do you think that the rotation from tech and growth to value, value cyclicals has more room to go? I'm just wondering how you're thinking about the signals because we've also had some volatility in oil. I think last time we talked, you've been waiting for a long time. You were starting to see signals that made you more confident. How are you thinking about that kind of rotation right now? Well, after today's price action, I am supremely more confident that that is what's going on. You know, I, I was kind of vocal in my Slack channel today when spreads were ticking at their lows, you know, and I'm talking about across the oil complex. And I'm saying, you know, if this doesn't hold here, then this whole gasoline driven rally was a flash in the pan and easily buttoned up. And that was such a great capitulative moment. You know, it was, you know, the oil bull saying, this is our last chance, guys. You know, if we go down now, it is all the party's over. And from that moment of negativity, everything held and rallied. So to get back more directly to the question, um, I do think that there's room for more of a rotation into some of the commodity stocks and out of the technology stocks that we've been talking about that have caused a little mini sentiment bubble at some level. Um, you get more confidence in it on a day like today. And what this really is going to be now is going to translate into, in my opinion, some, some form of revival of the great rotation, right? We had been trading the great rotation. That was 2020s trade where everything tech got crushed and commodities are 2021s trade. Everything commodities rallied, tech got crushed. And then we had to try to figure out what the next move was. So, excuse me, that was 2022 straight. I'm really losing track. Well, the here. years with COVID, it's like, I, don't ask me years. You got to yeah, say, is it all blended that. into three giant blob of horrible? And I just can't remember it. I can't remember. They absolutely have. So, so I think I have a good explanation for this, though. At that point, you know, the what I call the great rotation, which was the Bloomberg Commodity Index divided by the NASDAQ, was basically trading at 0.25. It rallied to 0 0.50 at a point when, you know, oil was trading at its highs and tech was on its lows at the end of the year. It has sold off in that last commodity sell off that we saw for the first six months of this year that was really a bear market in commodities. And now it looks like the time is finally right for crude oil to come alive. Right. So we're in the middle of summer. We're seeing a gasoline tightness driven rally. We're seeing OPEC cut production, make the right commentary that they're going to keep production cuts going possibly even steeper so to me the setup is right for oil to come alive here and this is just going to be a regeneration of the great rotation which really traded all the way back to where it started from so i'm talking about this you know ratio going from 0.25 to 0.5 and back to about 0.28 and so now the great rotation is picking up again where commodities may have a chance to outperform tech in the short term while we burst this ai bubble and possibly go off to the races in oil Great potential for that to happen for sure. Yeah. You know what's interesting too that you're pointing out that it was like the great capitulation moment and then it held. That's in the face of that really weak data from China. I mean, that had a lot of people concerned. You would have thought that would have just, you know, thrown fire on uh fuel on the fire with that for those yeah. people who are worried about the supply side. The bulls in the energy market should have their chests out after today's session, right? We had spreads hold on the lows. 
We had a $3 straight line rally from the low to the high of the range in WTI crude oil. Um, excuse me. In addition to that, we saw things like refiners. Marathon Petroleum today traded to a new all-time high. XLE was a two-sigma loser earlier this morning. It recovered to settle in positive territory. I mean, there are some things to be really excited about in the energy market after today's session. That's for sure. Yeah. So we have... Um... Jim is asking, is energy extended? Is there more room to run? I think you just answered that, Jim. Um, so yeah, let I, me know I, if there's... I can add a little color, Maggie. Not sure. to I'm sorry. So we're at the top of the range here at $83 in crude oil. 50 cents or so above this level, there is going to be a breakout for 8 or $10 that is going to happen because we're at the range top now. Uh -huh. Can it fail? Can we get more weak data out of China that scares the bulls and catches us offside a little bit? can absolutely happen. But if we see crude oil tick about another 50 cents higher, I'm expecting CTAs to pile in further on the long side, and that's going to drive the market higher. That's great color to add. Uh, the um, Doug asking, if rates will be persistently higher, does that mean the DXY will be higher and therefore commodities will struggle? Are, are, that, is the dollar factoring into your... Yes, it is. Of course it is. That's a great, you know, uh, that, that's your risk case, essentially, in my opinion, is that, you know, we do have these rising rate or persistently rising rates, you know, maybe not spiking, but they're kind of trading higher. Could cause, you know, more kind of short covering, the dollar trading maybe up a little bit more. If it causes the dollar to break its downtrend, which I kind of see it as being in, it's been making lower highs despite the good performance lately. If it breaks the downtrend, that's the risk for up to a commodity rally, right? If the dollar starts soaring, there's no way base metals are going to hang in against that. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely the risk. But at the same time, we've seen years where the dollar goes down and commodities wind up rallying at the end of the day, or at the end of the year. So I'm not going to let that hold me back from being a commodity bull. I may let it temper my bullishness and my positioning if something like a dollar explosion happens, though. Mm, that's um, that's great. Uh, I'm just thinking, uh, Doug, if you want more color on that, I don't know if you follow Brent Donnelly, but he was talking about he's he follows Forex really closely, and he was tweeting about that today, if I'm not mistaken, about the dollar in the short term. So you might want to check that out. When you're talking about commodities here, uh, Tony. Are you talking about the entire complex? Because I'm I'm hearing you talk about oil. What about some of the other metals? Like, are we are we being more? Is it a monolithic group now moving, oh. or are you a little bit? You got to be careful about what you're talking about. I'm thinking for people who might be in ETFs where there's a basket of them. Yeah, you know, as a, as a tape reader, the one thing that I picked up is that you know oil separating itself from the pack. Right. Mm -hmm. Gasoline is separating itself. The diesel fuel is that that's what's separating itself from the pack. The base metal complex, I mean, today was case in point. You know, we got bad news out of China. LME copper opens on its 200 day moving average and trades straight down. Right. It, it, this, these, there are signs of breakdown there. You know, whether it's the strong dollar or the weak China data, I don't care. Price action stinks in base metals. Okay. Right. It, their rallies have been fadeable. There has been no sign, despite low inventories across the board, there has been no sign of any kind of upside fire drill in base metals. So I'm not looking for that. I'm not really hunting in that ring right now. I'm very, very crude oil centric in this move, quite honestly. I mean, even gold is backing off and probably rightfully so. If real rates are going lower, that's been a weight on gold ever since. So I'm kind of not shocked that gold is pulling back now as well. So I'm really kind of oil centric when it comes to the energy bull market right now, Maggie. I mean, and between energy, oil, gas, diesel fuel, refiners, oil services, XLE, I mean, I don't have time to breathe outside the energy sector when I wake up and look at the markets. So John asking a little bit more specifically, I think you mentioned it briefly, about gold. Um, it sounds like you're not because you're more keen on oil, you're not really looking at gold. Is it looking good from a long-term perspective, John's asking? I mean, you know, what's interesting about gold is that it is held in despite real rates going a lot lower. You know, that, that's one of the things that you have to give gold uh, credit for. I think it probably has something to do with, you know, I mean, Kevin made a great point today that China's reserves, gold reserves were dangerously low um, in a world that the United States, um, you know, has taken the liberties of, 
you know, shutting people out of the Swiss system, confiscating gold, et cetera. You know, China has probably said, we don't have enough gold on our balance sheets compared to the rest of the central banks, so we probably have to catch up. I think that might have a lot to do with why gold is hanging in there closer to 2K um, rather than falling back below 1700. So we'll see what happens. It hasn't broken through that 2080 on the upside either. And now there's three tops up there. And people have been saying forever that there's no such thing as a triple top. Show them the gold chart and tell them what they think of this. So it's a really tough one to figure out right now. I just lost money on a gold miners trade thinking that they were underperforming. Well, they underperformed even more. I stopped out. I lost a little money. And now I'm focused on the oil market where I seem to be able to make it back rather quickly. Yeah. And that has been the gold trade has been so frustrating for folks uh, because there have been a lot of things that should be lining up for it, as you say, though, and it just hasn't materialized. Uh, gee, you guys are asking such great questions. I'm, I'm just going to I'm going to keep asking them right now. Um, G asking, uh, and this is related to your Kevin interview. I'm glad you had a chance to watch it. Uh, Kevin suggested we may be in a new regime where stock and bond correlation is positive. Uh, without recapping the whole thing, I would just encourage you all to go watch it um, because there's a lot in there. But um, what was your kind of gut reaction to that, Tony? He was asking, what does Tony think of that? Yeah, you know, I mean, I can conjure scenarios. I'm, I'm not as good as an economist as Kevin. So, you know, I can kind of make scenarios up in my head where I see bond and stock correlation being very tight and other situations where I see it collapsing, you know, and, but in, in general, you know, if we're going to have bonds rallying rates coming off and stocks rallying, I can buy into that scenario. You know, I don't really see the side where rates can come off much further unless we do finally find that recession around the corner that everybody's afraid of, but nobody can see. So if we ever run into that, I guess maybe there'll be a scenario where that correlation could be pretty tight. I mean, why couldn't we go on some sort of an easing path that from these levels, everybody says, oh, let's get right back into technology again and oil's rallying so we can buy that. And then there goes the S&P. Yeah, yeah. By the way, th it's important to make a distinction, I think, and we always try to do this, but there are short-term, I think you guys talked about them as squiggles today, <laughs> but there are short-term things that people say, could that happen? Sure. And then there are people who are kind of putting out their longer macro framework. And you hear Raul talk about this, it's in the academy super important to understand whether you're talking about a shorter term time frame or a longer term time frame because people can have very different opinions about things like correlation and inflation when you ask them or rates and the rate volatility we're seeing if you ask them about the next three months versus this longer more structural i would say um story that they're that they're thinking about or narrative that they're thinking about and i, I think kevin fits into that tony right yeah, you know, you got to know who you're talking to because I I put kids through college on squiggles that these guys are talking about. You know what exactly. I mean? I, I understand that they pick up these long term ranges and they're in these positions for tens of years and multi decades, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know how to do that, so I make money on an everyday basis, and I love the squiggles. You know what I mean? I think this is great. The squiggles are the greatest thing since sliced bread. I think I'm living in a house built by squiggles, so <laughs> you know, I don't see anything wrong with trading those squiggles. Long live the squiggles. Uh so we have we have inflation data coming up today. Given the bond volatility that we've seen, and I believe we have some more auctions coming. I think it's a thirty year later. Somebody put it in the comments. Is it? They're going to be all over the place, but I think we might have a thirty year one coming later in the week. Um, certainly, it's longer longer out the curve. Um, how are you thinking about this inflation data? How do you how do you position or trade ahead of it? What are your thoughts about that? You know, I'm on the edge of my seat, quite honestly. You know, we're, we're right at what I think is the turn in inflation, where the Federal Reserve has beat it back successfully from the highs by really slowing down the economy as best they could. And it's coming back to bite now, you know, mm -hmm. and, and every trader kind of can tell that we're at this turn where, you know, we, we've been doing great with that with on the CPI days. It's been coming in with very tame data. Um, the markets had a, a number of different reactions depending on kind of how the setup goes into CPI day. We've seen rallies, we've seen sell-offs. What I'm expecting is that the rise, recent rise in energy prices is going to cause some kind of an upside stir in the CPI data, you know, sooner rather than later. I'm hoping into my, uh, what is it, the data that we see this week, um, a, a number that's worse inflation than expected 
something that can derail the bond market and send rates higher. But I think it also sends a signal to the commodity markets that the interest rate moves have done nothing to tame them. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see, in my opinion, I think a, a higher than expected inflation number will get people to turn and say, well, I better get back into commodities. You know, they've kind of been sideways to nowhere. And now if we're going to see inflation persist, the stuff that was working during that inflationary time were the basic materials and energy stocks and tech wasn't. So maybe that adds to a more inflationary number, a, low, a downside dislocation in the bond market. I think that could lead us back to that great rotation where commodities take that as a cue that they can perform and tech takes that as a cue that they should sell off because they reached that AI peak. So we'll see what happens. That's just one of the scenarios I could conjure up though by this week. Yeah, it's going to be, I think, a super interesting, uh, super interesting number. Trillion X asking, don't you think, do you think that the consensus is still underweight in commodity related stocks? He's saying, don't you think, but where is the consensus in terms of or, or weighting market positioning when it comes to commodity related stocks? Maggie, you remember the, the chart that we put up like two weeks ago where we yeah. showed every sector flow from the beginning of the year? Yes. What, did that, what did that look like? The jaws opened up with technology inflows and energy outflows. So we do not only think that people have flown out of the energy sector, we have circumstantial and observable evidence that they do not own this stuff. So that's why you see on days like today when it comes in and it's super cheap on support, the smart traders that don't have an allocation there yet say, I'm going to take advantage of this price action and get into the energy market while it's down 2% and see what happens. And so they were rewarded today. So when you give the energy bulls some money to make and some you know, dry powder, that's when the trade starts rolling your direction. So we'll see what happens, man. Uh, two different people asking uh, about Nat Gas. Jim Griffin saying, Nat Gas chart looks like a bad EKG. What possible <laughs> catalyst could provide a revival? You know, I, it's one of those things. I, I, I can't chase it until it wakes up and starts going. You know, it seems like the market's balanced. It seems like the market likes these prices either side of 250, broadly speaking. It doesn't seem like we're seeing huge fund flows into positioning either way. We're not seeing spreads take off and, and you know, into steep backwardation that gets everybody excited. Uh, I would imagine, though, that, you know, coming into winter, there are probably some kind of trade to look at there. You know, we're definitely not all buttoned up in terms of our natural gas resources over the winter across the globe. So we'll see if there's another, um, you know, another bump in the road. But I can't get excited about the the commodity that just hasn't moved and hasn't given me a sign to chase it or or really get involved for any reason. Yeah, and and we've asked this before. You are bullish on both uh, oil, the commodity, and also equity, right? Yes, ma'am. Extremely. You know, it, we're seeing leadership out of oil services and refiners again. You know, the crack spread won't back off. Marathon Petroleum trading a new high. I mean, this is bull market stuff. You know, we could have another year where what if, what if Marathon Petroleum has back to back up 80 percent years and nobody's in it? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the important part. So I think um, we are. We are looking at a situation where. Um, you're looking at positioning as much as you are, because whenever we talk about commodities, it's the supply side, the demand side. And then you're also pointing out at the last few weeks that everyone's not, no one's in it, right? Like just the positioning on it. Is one of those things more important than the other in terms of your forecast? Like what would change your mind again? And because you've been super sort of liking the action you've seen, what would cause you to sort of pull up stakes and get a little more cautious again? You know, once you see, you know, the commitment of traders reports blatantly showing, you know, a lot of spec length in futures and, you know, they're not there yet. They can buy a lot more. You know, they, they, they've upped their participation with this rally to the top of the range like they always do. There's been a little bit of a bump in open interest, but it's still at fairly historically low levels, which gives you confidence that, you know, there's no gigantic long out there that's sweating with a bullseye on his back, right, that's about to get stopped out. Um, as long as those are conditions, I'm okay with staying long crude oil. You know, we'll get to that point where, you know, funds get long and saturated. And a lot of times that's already driven the market five, six or ten dollars higher. And then we play um, hot potato with the positions at the highs. And the market doesn't necessarily have to back off when funds get long. 
Mm. Right. What will happen is the last funds in that got long will wind up selling it to the next fund that hasn't a dollar of oil risk on their pad yet, because we just saw the jaws open up where everybody flowed out of energy. So if you get a set of portfolio managers that decide they want to get into energy, then we'll find a bid, you know, consistently through this level. And, you know, th this sector to me, there's so much opportunity in, in terms of it becoming a bigger chunk of the S&P over time and things like that. So th th there's both long and short term opportunity. And I think I got away from the question a little bit there. Uh, the ne never. <laughs> Not right. at all. Tony, great stuff. Thank you so much. We got you twice today and it was a total pleasure. Uh, again, if you. If you want to go check out that interview, it's on our platform. Well worth your time. We appreciate you, Tony. Awesome, Maggie. Great job today. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks so much. We will be back tomorrow uh, for our extended. Don't miss that. And we realize a lot of questions on bonds, a lot of division about opinion. Raul's doing an AMA with Ash uh, on the Crypto Daily Briefing, I believe at noon on Friday. We're going to see if we can get in front of him uh, his thoughts on bonds too. So we, we'll keep you posted on that, but we're kind of dogging him behind the scenes um, to see what he thinks about all this volatility. So stay tuned for that. We'll see you tomorrow. In the meantime, take care and good luck out there. Our story begins in 2014 after the largest financial crisis the world had ever experienced since the crash of 1929. Since then, we've made it our mission to democratize the very best financial intelligence. We broke the story of Bitcoin in 2014 before the general public even knew what it was. We've made award-winning documentaries and series about some of the most important economic and geopolitical events of our time that have amassed millions of views across platforms. And we've spoken with investing legends about trends years before they played out. Here at Real Vision, we don't follow the news, we make the news. This week on social media, we'll be showcasing some of the most important pieces in our history, unlocking some of them for you to watch for free and sharing important takeaways from them that will be useful for you in today's markets. So be sure to tune in. We also have a very special offer just for you guys. To learn more, simply click on the link in the description or scan the QR code.